Well, this is revolution is fastly or quickly becoming my favorite podcast. And here are the hosts, Jason Miles. And I'm probably going to mispronounce your name, Pascal Ro- Robert. Like Steve, this Robert. Steve and Colbert and put the R O. The T is silent, but not you. And Jason is. <laughs> That's my new. Jason comes to us from Mexico, and Pascal, where are you out of? Where, 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 in Miami, where? Florida. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear that. Miami. Sometimes I am too. You, you, you're the you're the Florida man. No, I'm not crazy. the Florida man. I'm originally from New York. I live in Florida now. Okay. Well, I, I will never be the Florida man. So we sometimes we prepare our segments, and sometimes we fly by the seat of our pants, and I think. Listening to this is revolution. I pretty much know what we can talk about, and that would be Ukraine, right? Oh, I shit. Think. <laughs> oh, we just <laughs> last thing I wanted to talk about. Ah, I love that. I love that. Somebody gave me the trombone. That's fantastic. I, I have my soundboard here, so. Oh, please, fire away. Ah, fire away. I, I, I was that's definitely a curveball because I was not uh, expecting we talk about that at all. It's nothing people it's are talking fault. about. I blame I blame myself. Uh, there's a video. I, by the time I sent the video, I knew it was too late. You were you were deep into your show. And I knew you didn't have time to watch it. I even cut I, it I, 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 short. What, what 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 did you what did you want to talk about? We wanted to talk about what our show is tomorrow, which is about race craft in medical statistics, and explain exactly what that means. <laughs> Or that that one didn't work. <laughs> that was that was inappropriate. <laughs> so close. So ra- racecraft and medical statistics. Now I'm going to guess having not. Let me just guess that this would be uh, showing how African Americans are treated by our healthcare system. Actually, it's a bit of a a bit of a nuanced spin of the scholar that we're going to have. Tell you what I think it is. Let me tell you what I think it is, and then you guys go right ahead. I I would talk about the African American nurse who died from COVID, not the the African American doctor who died here in the United States from COVID. Uh, (laughs) It was treated as though she were a common criminal. I would talk about pain management for African Americans and how they lucked out because of prejudice. We see fewer uh, African Americans addicted to opiates because doctors always assume that a person of color is complaining about pain to work the system, whereas a white person, their pain is legitimate. So here's some oxycotton. I would talk about experiments on African Americans that were conducted unwittingly. Is that where we're going with this? No, actually, not the spin we're having at all. Oh, hang on for one second. Hang on. Okay, Jason. Before we get serious, that's not correct. You're saying? Nope. Okay, hang on. You're you're not the only one who can. All right. What? 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 What are, what are we talking? About? What are we talking? Actually, about? What we're talking about is the way in which statistics that are used to demarcate the health condition of Black people oftentimes turns into racial categorization of "quote unquote" Blackness when the actual contributing factors have nothing to do with actually being Black but the economic and class position of Black people disproportionately being poor, i.e. when you hear a statistic that says uh, the percentage of Black people who suffer from heart disease is 35% higher than it is for white Americans. Part of the consequence of having that outlook is just like, oh, well, Black people have defective hearts almost genetically because obviously 35% more Black people have bad heart conditions. So there must be something genetically defectively wrong with Black people. What that statistic, that statistic won't tell you is that 35% of Black people statistically have more heart disease because 35 the, the difference between the rate of poverty 
and the proximity to certain foodstuffs that Black people eat that will increase heart disease is actually 35%, i.e., well, what percentage of Black people actually eat the kind of food that will contribute to heart disease? Oh, my, 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 it's actually 35%. So what we find is that it has nothing to do with actually Blackness causing a 35% higher rate of Black people with heart disease. It has to do with that people who happen to be Black are eating foods because of their proximity and their economic poverty. And part of the consequences of just simply relegating this to a problem of Blackness as a problem of economic situation is that it denies the resources to change the actual class position of the Black people who are suffering from these adverse health statistics. Food deserts, for example, the the supermarkets not Mm -hmm. going into uh, poorer neighborhoods Mm -hmm. affects people because of their class, not because of their race, although it is fair to say that a lot of supermarket chains are racist and don't want to open in a, a, a primarily black community. That is I would, fair. I would say. say they'll open in a black community that has uh, where it's the economic standing meets their requirements. When these businesses open, you know, they're first and foremost looking at economic demographics. So if your neighborhood doesn't fit within that paradigm, then of course, you're not going to open a store there. It's just not cost effective. Right. So, it, it, yeah, I mean, you're going to see fast food restaurants. Mm-hmm. You're going to see dollar stores. Nothing. You're going to see fast food restaurants. Um, you're, you're going to see a lot of nothing. I mean, also, we have to keep in mind that a lot of the way these places open up, especially the bigger the place, like a grocery store, is centered around um highways (laughs) your ability to drive there so we're not really seeing that um in more urbanized areas right unless it's economically viable now someone in the chat asked a uh, very good question they were saying well there are certain illnesses that have a racial component they mentioned sickle cell sickle cell is a different situation there is definitely a correlation between being a a descendant of African diasporic people and sickle cell. Sickle cell is a disease that exists amongst African diasporic people because of the genetic necessity to create a remedy for malaria. So this is a a disease that is correlated to the geographic proximity of Black people to the African continent. I understand that. But someone also mentioned what about, you know, uh, high blood pressure or diabetes, I would argue that those illnesses are a product of class and diet that are a consequence of race being a form of class oppression in America. What do I mean by that? The reality in America is that race is a means of categorizing Blackness into poverty. In other words, the default assumption is that if you are Black, you are poor, not because there are more Black people that are poor, because anyone who actually looks at statistics know there are many more white people who are poor, there are many more white people who are on welfare than Black people. But what it is, is that there's a disproportionately larger number of Black people who are poor. And part of the reason that is, is that Persistently throughout American capitalism, Black people have been relegated to surplus redundant labor. What does that mean? That's a fancy way of saying that Black people generally are the least ones hired for the best jobs and the first ones to get fired for the mediocre jobs. Right. And that has historically been the case. What do we see in Africa? In primarily. I'm going to say that. I'm going to give you an example. Uh, I want to use Haiti because that's a better example that I'm familiar with because my parents are from Haiti. If you look at Haitians who live in the United States, you will find that there's a high rate of diabetes that Haitians in the United States suffer from. Now, that's largely a consequence of processed food, diet, the kind of rich foods they eat, and the kind of Haitian food they eat in America is Haitian food that is like the food that you only eat on Easter Sunday once a year, 
in, mm -hmm. in, in Haitian society, you're eating that every night. If you actually look at Haitians, particularly in the poor population, the peasant population, the rate of diabetes is profoundly low. Interesting, interesting. And China, we saw that with China. When China, when Deng Xiaoping opened up China to the West, he opened up the Chinese to obesity, heart disease. Same thing happened in Japan. And, and Japan yeah, and opened up their, their doors to uh, a lot of uh, Western fast food restaurants. Um, right. So the point that we're trying to show with our show, Rudy, talking about racecraft and medical statistics, is not that because of social, economic, and some would say cultural phenomenon. Black people are not disproportionately suffering adverse health qualities and statistics. The argument we're saying is that they're not suffering this because they are Black. They're suffering this because disproportionately they have been relegated to poverty. And if we understand that and deal with the problem relative to the fact that this is a class and capitalist problem, perhaps we'd be more adequate to address the remedies to the I community. mean, I, th I think a bigger issue here is that, you know, flyover country isn't really sexy to talk about. And since a lot of Black people live in major metropolitan areas, you're always going to, it's going to be a big city topic, right? New York, LA, Chicago. Right. No one really wants to talk about the problem with you know, Twin Falls, Idaho. No one really wants to talk about, you know, obesity in, you know, uh, Parkersburg, West Virginia. Every Walmart, I mean, there's a whole meme of Walmart shoppers. Half this country is obese. Half of America is obese. So how does this compare to, is there is there a country in Europe, Great Britain, that uh, where <laughs> I mean, America so sits alone in a lot of the obesity. I mean, you can go across the border to Canada, and even their McDonald's is vastly different from ours as far as what they serve and even how it looks. It just when McDonald's is healthier across the imaginary line. What, what do we see with people of color uh, in uh, their in countries in Europe where we're where, we, where there are safety nets, where there isn't the kind of poverty we see here in the United States. Well, there's still a racialization factor that exists even in countries that have a larger social safety net. For example, I use this, I use this kind of a analogy all the time that demonstrates that even in Europe, capitalism requires a, racial, a racially otherized community. For example, in France, 10% of the population of the country of France is Muslim, right? Now, these are mostly Algerians, North Africans. You'll have some West Africans as well. 60% of the prison population in France is Muslim. Now, that's a massive disparity. So the question you ask... That's, right? that's, that's, that's almost America. I mean, that's like something we do in America. Right, well, this is the it's, thing, and I'm, I'm glad you said that, <clears throat> because in America... We Usually often, they, they, they go in, in France, they go in as Muslims. In America, you have to wait till they go in and then they become Muslims. Well, that, that is a trope that, that, that I understand where you're going with that. But the point I'm going to make is that in America, we usually ascribe racialized criminal, criminality or black crime to cultural defect, social de defect, family dislocation, a variety of other proxies that are really just race. In other words, because we are beyond the age of eugenics and we can't say, well, black people are genetically criminal because they're genetically criminal, we'll just say, well, oh, black people are criminal because their culture is defective. And black people's mm -hmm. culture is defective because they happen to be criminal. It, it creates this well, absurd I'm, tautology. We had so John McWhorter, we had John McWhorter on the Ralph Nader show. And He's written a book yes. that criticizes black culture. Right. It's, it's like his thing. Yeah, his it's, thing you know, it's an absurdity because this is my response. Okay. Uh, French Muslims are not watching Soul Train and going to the disco <laughs> and eating chitlins and pork chops, yet they make up 60% of the prison population in France. What exactly is the uh, Black American culture or cultural phenomenon that is causing them to be inclined to crime? Those same Francophone Muslims 
if they were in America, would be owning all of the cultural, the, the, the corner stores and bodegas in black neighborhoods. And would be considered, yeah. some of them would be considered model minorities. So the, the quarter, a, a linguist, teaches at Columbia, African American, mm-hmm. grew up in some, you know, privileged p- parents were professional. I'm with McCord, 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 upper middle class Philadelphia. I know him well, and I'm not a fan. And like another African-American from Philadelphia, uh, he tells black people basically not to steal the pound cake and pull up your pants. And I'm talking about Bill Cosby. (laughs) Yeah. He's a bit of a scold. And he says that that you have to blame the black culture for some statistics Mm -hmm. uh, about their schooling, like... Uh, ner- black nerds, it's frowned upon to read. I mean, look, I, I, yes. push, I push back super hard on the, all that stuff that McCorder has to say, because basically he, he, I call, I said to him on the show, I don't know if they cut it out. I said, you're right wing. Yeah, you're just a right wing. He works for the yeah, Manhattan Institute. It's oh, a right wing. He writes for no, this John McWhorter is financed and supported by the Manhattan Institute, which is a right. right-wing think tank that literally is a supporter of Charles Murray and pushing scientific racism, all right? All right. He is basically, a, I say this all the time, I'm going to be very frank, Dan, I hope I don't offend you and your audience. There are, there are liberal West race pimps and there are right-wing race pimps. What do I mean by that? There are liberals who make their money talking about race to get paid who really are not interested in solutions, but they're there for the gravy train. They're He's conser- Candace Owens with an education. Say, say that again. What'd you He's say? Candace Owens with an education. Pretty much. And what I'm trying to inform your audience is that the same way you have liberal race pimps, you have right-wing race pimps who do the same thing. Because let me ask you a question. John McWhorter is a linguist. Thomas Sowell is an econ- economist. Glenn Lowry is an economist. Would does anyone ever ask them about linguist, linguistic studies, economics, economics, or economic research? Why is it the only thing that they talk about is something that has nothing to do with their specialty? Wow. Which is black people. Wow. In other words, if these, if these folks didn't talk about black people, no one would, would care what they would say. I mean, the fact yeah. that he's kind of bringing out this racial trope that, I mean, you could really look back into kind of the culture industry in the mid to, to late 80s, which really started to define a black culture as being something that was inherently uh, ghetto, right? right? Well, this is the thing. What's, what's really fascinating is that John McWhorter will tell you that like, oh, it's the urban culture of, uh, of black people, post-civil rights and blah, blah, blah. Charles Johnson was a black sociologist in the early 20th century. As a matter of fact, he is the grandfather of Jay Johnson, who was the former head of Homeland Security, if I'm not mistaken. Right. Charles Johnson, in I believe- Under Obama. Obama. Yes, under Obama, yes. Charles Johnson, I believe in 1925, basically said, there are two or three things that America will always assume about black people. One, that they're inherently intellectually inferior, and two, that they are criminal. This is in 1925. Where was the hip hop music and the urban underclass culture back then? <laughs> they called right. it jazz. Right. Which we must preserve, which we should. Uh, this is great. First of all, I want to thank Rodrigo for booking you guys on the show. I am very grateful. And I hope you find a home here. Uh, because I'm quitting and I want you guys to take the show. <laughs> somebody worthy of the of my audit. No, I hope you will keep coming back. Keep have keep having us and we'll we'll keep coming no, no. back. We, we have a ball coming on here. So uh so, so McWhorter's new book. If I can I just return to McWhorter for a second? Do you mind? Sure. Uh, he's I, you're I, triggering Pascal, so I gotta hear about no, this. No, I love I love hating him. Okay, so Ralph Nader said, make sure you read his new book. Mm-hmm. And, before he came on the show. I didn't read all of it. I read, you know, I know how to skim a book. Mm-hmm. And I got to this passage. Oh, shit. And oh, I couldn't shit. believe what I saw. Welfare, he said, during the 60s and 70s, leftists went into black communities 
to encourage black people to get on welfare in the hopes that they would overturn our economy that they, these were leftists these were communists who believed that the way to destroy capitalism was to get on welfare by putting black it was white people who were communists okay. who want to destroy the system I know exactly what he's talking about is there and I read that and I thought uh you write something like this mm -hmm. you're in QAnon country no right? I know what he's talking about he's talking about Francis you know what Francis he's talking Fox about Trump. is that true is that true no, he's talking, well let me explain. listen he's talking about Francis Fox Piven Francis Fox Fox Piven, Piven was a left academic in the 60s who made the argument that we should actually push for the state to provide for poor and working class people and if they do not we should push the state to to the point where they break the system it was not a conspiracy theory he's framing it as if it was some kind of quote unquote conspiracy theory and it's actually a right-wing talking point and the notion that quote unquote white people were quote unquote pushing black people on welfare is absurd because if you actually read the research on welfare at that time the main reason why black people were going quote, going on welfare is because they were disproportionately and adversely affected by deindustrialization because they were the last ones who were eligible for those already disappearing manufacturing and industrial he doesn't jobs. talk about that McCorder doesn't really discuss that because either. why because up until 1965 over 60 percent of black labor were sharecroppers or domestic labor because of mechanized right. farming and the rise of the end of Jim Crow that labor became obsolete so what and not covered by social security because they were not covered by social security up until 1959 but that's correct yeah so that labor force becomes basically obsolete in terms of american political economy and they are integrating into an american capitalism that is beginning to pivot to neoliberalism and deindustrialization. urban crime rates already start to rise in america in the 1960s before the implementation of the great society so how is it it's the welfare how is the welfare the problem that's destroying these communities? What's destroying these communities is that what happens is that you have a lack of capacity of Black people to actually function and compete in capitalism because there are no jobs anymore. Because if you listen to actually what King and Bayard Rustin and even Malcolm X said during the 60s, they said that deindustrialization and technology are making labor obsolete and legislating jobs is not going to change things. And what is ironic is that even Bayard Rustin and King's acolytes knew in 1965 that the civil rights movement, 64 Civil Rights Act, and all those other acts were not going to be enough to change the condition of black people and that's why they tried to propose the freedom budget for all in 1965 which would have been in american uh, money today over 1.4 trillion dollars of a program demanding a federal jobs guarantee and things of that nature that couldn't be implemented because of the vietnam war okay last John, first of all will you come back next week oh, sure. oh yeah they sure last this is the last I'm, I'm we're we're out of time but this is what John McWhorter said on the Ralph Nader radio hour this week go download the Ralph Nader radio hour as a podcast it's the best uh I, I happen to believe it's the best podcast out there it took me forever sure. to realize that you were the host because I, 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 I introduced the guests that's all it's, it's uh this is revolution is also uh up there this is what John McWhorter said he said everybody was worried about Bill Clinton's welfare reform in 1994 95 I think it was 90 I'm Four. not sure 94 and he said and you look and you'll find that there are no single black moms sleeping on subway heating crates oh. that it was everybody everybody warned us that Bill Clinton's welfare reform would increase homelessness. And I went, I mean, it's okay to think that. In 2008, I mean, under the Obama presidency, within the first two years, 
black child poverty was the highest it has gone in recorded history of the United States. So how could he say that unless he... Because he's paid by the Manhattan Institute to make Americans believe that black people are the only people who fail in capitalism because they're culturally defective. That's the job of the black conservatives. The job of black conservatives is to tell the world and America that the only people who suffer during capitalism are black people because they are culturally defective. Even though more white people are on welfare, even though more white people are actually poor, and even though the rate of white single parenthood is the exact same amount that it is now when uh, the Moynihan report came out in the 1960s. So the where's all the cultural defectiveness that white folk are going to, 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 to all the speciation? Because Moynihan literally said that black people will become a different species because of single parent birth. So I'm waiting for this to happen to white folk. So on the show, <laughs> on the show, Pascal and Jason, on the Ralph Nader Radio, and I don't know if they cut it out. I said- Someone in the chat said, said they cut it out. Huh? Someone in the chat said they cut it out. I gotta right, hear. Right. I gotta hear. Pascal, right. I'm gonna go you listen to right it and wing? yell at the at the computer the whole time. I, I said to him, "You're right wing," mm -hmm. uh, and he said, "No, I'm not." I said, "Did you vote for Bernie?" And he said, "Well, I'm more of an Elizabeth Warren type." Listen, listen. John John McWhorter is a hustler. Okay, he is, John McWhorter has profound contempt for poor and working class and urban black folk because they rejected him because he was a corny geek, all right? He doesn't like black people because he was always antagonized by them because he basically talks like a caramel colored white guy. That's his right. whole problem. Right, we have to wrap it up. Pascal Robert, Jason Miles, host of This Is Revolution. I hope to see you uh, next week, okay. if you can do it. Yeah. We, we've only scratched the surface. So thank you so much. Please come back. You're listening to The David Feldman Show. And download This Is Revolution, wherever great podcasts are heard.